Falka, uh, would you want to come in on this? Because they made some very interesting points regarding how uh, how we, we could uh, go forward regarding Industry 4.0. Yeah, so just, just taking an example of, let's say, the power sector, like just we mentioned about uh, how India has to make a transition. But India also has an opportunity because India is an unexplored market. Like coming to the power sector, I've worked in the power sector myself in the country. And I can see, we let's come to metering. Like if uh, we people move from manual meters to digital to smart, but there are unexplored areas in the country where you do not have a meter. So you start with a smart meter, and when it comes to jobs, you create newer jobs by people who are trying to analyze the data out of the smart meter. He doesn't need to move physically, but then because if there's a smart meter there, not only it creates energy efficiency, as a user, a consumer is benefited, as well as as a producer, the, uh, the, uh, the government company is also benefited. So India, seeing India in, uh, in the perspective of uh, Industry 4.0, we also uh, are an adv advantage because of this unexplored potential in terms of automation. So we will make this jump, and when we make this jump, this huge repository of uh, the human resources we have, not just reskilling, I think the first time skilling also can be to a higher level skill. And let's not look at our country as a country of manual labor only. So our young population is educated, IT enabled, so they can pick up fast and become a part of this job market, which is not just uh, an assembly line production. So why should a company offer its technology uh, and investments and money to have facilities in India, what does it take uh, for a company to do or make such a, have such a decision? It's a simple fact for us, 99.9% uh, .9 of the world population doesn't live in Sweden. 16% uh, <laughs> live in India. And uh, we are much taller uh, than, uh, than Sweden. Uh, we are not a superpower, uh, but we have the finest technology. And to find partners with equal values and share common views. Uh, to share something is also extremely good because that will create also greater opportunities for us to do more investments in, in India, to develop even further. But it will also have a good effect on the Swedish defense capability due to have a partnership, exactly the same way we have done it in, in, uh, in uh, Brazil. So for us, we need partnerships. Uh, we we um, are a small country and uh, need to partner and share technology. You can't have anything if you don't are willing to share or give something. It's, it's a wrong thought. On the end of the day, you find models, and we have shown that in other countries, where we can also share the, the outcome of that type of, of uh, technology transfer. Right. Federer, you wanted to make a point? Yeah, I, I think we're on to something really important here, because, because the, what I find really uh, interesting is that India has such much potential, uh, but it's about unleashing it. And, and what I think sometimes we talk about the smile curve, you probably know it. Uh, where do we bring the most value into products? Uh, and, and it's definitely a higher value when you invent something than pr to produce it. So uh, what, what I think uh, could be very beneficial for India is to basically look into how, when will we see great innovations coming from India? And, and we have some of the smartest people I know are definitely from India. Uh, and, and why don't we get a lot of innovations? And just using, if you see, look at Sweden, we're like 9 million people. But when we had our greatest uh, inventions, we were only 3 or 4 million people. It's like one small area of South Delhi. Uh, and, <laughs> and we have huge, we have fantastic companies like Com Combiant and Saab, Ericsson and so forth. It's basically about what are you focus focusing on and do what game are we playing. So there's a difference between me and Tendulkar uh, being a cricket player. Uh, is that perhaps I'm a better cricket player than Tendulkar. Perhaps I'm the world's best uh, cricket player. But we don't play cricket in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know the rules. We don't, there's no, I couldn't even gather a team. There's some teams coming up now, actually. But, but we don't have it. So basically, it's about what game do you play? You should, India should play the game of innovation. Uh, Saab is the only one uh, building a new fighter today, a uh, new submarine, at least in, the, the, uh, in our part of the world. 
But what I think is a huge opportunity for India, and I, I believe if you should develop these type of uh, high uh, profile and uh, high technology products, is to have the whole process together. Uh, you can't just have people doing design and engineering and then you ask someone, can you produce, produce it for me? Mm -hmm. It has to be combined. And I think point. that is the, the most important uh, lesson learned. I think most of my colleagues, CEOs around the world, if you can't talk to each other, the guy doing the design... Can't be in silos. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Skilled engineers, skilled designers, skilled workforce, and you can, due to the density of population, you can put people together. Don't, don't yes, just think that you should do only design and engineering or something like that. It's the combination and bringing people together and create that type of environment that will, will create competitiveness for, for India. Right. I think we have less than five minutes, right? Uh, uh, let's, let's end our discussion on the point regarding innovation. DIPP again is uh, taking the lead in what is known as Startup India. Mm. Um, uh, if you can just tell us about what the, has it meant uh, in terms of thinking about such a program of, of, of for encouraging innovation and, and what do we uh, see in the recent future as far as startup is concerned? Either you or Dushan, if you can yeah. just give a yeah. quick perspective. So maybe just a couple of points. I think I'll just uh, go back to that starting line that, you know, we are talking about here more about job creators than job seekers. Mm -hmm. And India's, dem we are talking about, you know, 10 million jobs a year. Where do they come from? Right. You, you know, so that's what is being instilled in our systems. We are trying to see that, you know, uh, so, so from, from the perspective of startups, uh, that's what we've seen, that uh, there's a huge amount of interest which is there amongst, uh, you know, Indian people which are there. Uh, they're, they're all very well educated. And uh, that's where, you know, Government of India has launched Startup India. Uh, very clearly, you know, there's a facilitation aspect which we are handling there. And uh, just to share some numbers, we've had something like 60,000 you know, queries which we have, you know, responded to in less than a year and a half. So that just shows, you know, what sort of interest is there. And uh, I did share, you know, a couple of numbers in the presentation of how it's sort of going up. But uh, it's, it's again something which is not happening only at a national level. Startups is something which is happening at a state level. So in, uh, I would say since January 2016, 11 states in India have actually come out with startup policies. And it is a very critical aspect of, you know, uh, the overall uh, industrial policy of the state, and you know, all of them are sort of moving into that. Okay, so the red card is up, uh, uh, but uh, you know, I would want. Uh, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Just short comment. Uh, one thing that we see now, we see it globally, but we see it in Sweden, is the, the combination of startups and and, uh, and global leaders. So the combination of companies like Saab and Comias and startup. Uh, open up the labs, uh, opening up the labs like ABB is doing and so forth. A lot of companies are doing that. That's something that is also worth looking into. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, Hakon, uh, Matt and uh, Sir, uh, I would want you three guys to uh, uh, do the concluding remarks on a topic which is related to innovation and that is accepting failure because you know, it seems that, you know, Indian companies need to be, uh, while they, some of them are engaged in R&D, most of them are R&D ever's. Uh, they would not want to put in, you know, capital when it comes to R&D. Uh, how, uh, uh, is it okay to fail when it comes to innovation and R&D? And if so, uh, uh, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you take that failure and, and then turn it into your success uh, story? The whole cell phone was an innovation coming from the development of the Gripen uh, radar or the da data link. And the management tried to avoid putting money into it. And that's their whole existence today. And I, being the leader, and also I have three engineers uh, examined myself, probably a very poor engineer ending up the, as the CEO. But if I, I uh, looking into uh, all the smart people we have at, at Saab, if you create an environment, if you put uh, and also listen to the people what they have possibility to do, then you will foster an environment where you can develop things also according to schedules that you have, but at the same time solving these type of difficult problems, people need free time to do a little bit things of their own. So there we uh, also giving uh, money or shares in the company for the best skunk work of the year. And some of the schedule things is not going in the right direction, uh, so we have lost some money on that. 
On the other side, uh, the skunk work uh, gives us a tremendous lot of possibility. What I mean is that when you're dealing with things, very much on the R things, uh, research, and especially when it comes to things that you can't Google, and, and bringing people together and learn from the failures, because then you can take next step and create a an, an, uh, positive uh, momentum for, for next technology move. Right. Matt and uh, Pankaj, you have just yep. one minute each, right? All right. Uh, yeah, okay. if you can just uh, conclude. Uh... If I listen to CEOs today, I think this is a fair statement for most of them. They have never been stronger than they are today, but they have never been more uncertain about the future than they are today as well. Regardless if you are building a truck or a car or an aircraft, I think most people are pretty uncertain about how will it be five years from now, ten years from now, with all the new technology. So when you look into the future, would you put your bet only on your R&D internally and believe that they know what's going on? I don't think it would be a good bet. So the only way to survive today is to open up, mm -hmm. work with others, learn from others, be open and follow what's happening. And one way of doing it is like we do together, to talk with other industries, create networks where you can discuss and learn from each other. The other part is to open up against the startup world because Failure is a natural part of learning something new, yeah. and we need to embrace that. And a cheap way to fail is to do it together because you share the risk. Another one is, of course, to work with startup companies because they are much faster, more efficient, and you can fail to go with them. So, so I think if we talk about the future, we want to embrace failure because we are all learning, but we have to learn together. So that's the last word. Thank you for joining us. We are completely out of time, and thank you for joining this session.